Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. The idea that you can grow your own food for a lot of people is really powerful. Keeping its story alive, that's important, because otherwise it's going to be lost forever. Give yourself the time and put in the effort, you will be rewarded. Today on Spotlight, a rising star in Biogenerator's portfolio. How this startup is helping solve some of the most challenging problems. Plus, a record-breaking swimmer writes a book about canine swimmers who save lives in Italy. And then exploring the history, physics, and engineering of hockey. But first, a group helping women grow their careers and get into male-dominated fields. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. In the heart of St. Louis, surrounded by red brick buildings and warehouses, is an unexpected oasis. One where women are digging in the dirt to plant sustainable vegetable gardens outside and sitting in classrooms inside learning about everything from construction to marketing to geospatial analysis. It's called Rung for Women. Rung for Women is a nonprofit organization that really focuses on helping women either change careers or grow in their existing careers. Our entire goal is we want women to move up the rungs of the economic opportunity ladder and attain more wealth. Rung opened our doors in uh, August of 2020, we had our first cohort in March of 2021, and in one year, we have served almost 300 women. In particular, Rung helps connect its members to careers where women are typically underrepresented, in industries that have significant growth potential but don't require a bachelor's degree. We know that St. Louis is certainly growing a location for geospatial roles, growing in technology, growing in entrepreneurship. So we really focus on those areas of growth so that, again, we look down the road, those roles won't be obsolete or automated in the next 10 to 15 years. Like geospatial analysts, coders and technologists, or medical coders, construction trades, roles where you know women are typically directed away from, those roles that are typically known as man's work. Um, we really are working with women to expose them to these career pathways and to connect them directly to employers. That geospatial learning comes through a computer-based course with Maryville University that offers a certificate in geospatial analysis. It's a separate course developed for Rung specifically for the skills that the three companies we partnered with said that they would need if they were to hire somebody from Rung. They will collect satellite imagery of different locations and they have to analyze what's there and mark so that you can say it's a road, it's a hospital, it's this type of building, it's this type of uh, geology, and that's what they do with the data. One of the first women to go through that program was Demisha White. Demisha left college after a year and had a good paying job with Amazon, but felt stuck and wanted to do something else with her life. She just didn't know what. When I came here, I was just open. I didn't even know, um, I knew that they had opportunities for career change, but I had no even idea what kind of career I wanted to change or what I wanted to go into. Here they introduced me to geospatial, the geospatial industry. And eventually after I finished, um, the six months course, I enrolled in the ArcGIS program through Maryville University, where I completed a certification in 90 days, uh, which got me the job right now that I'm in with Maxar. Right now, I'm a 3D geospatial production technician. Um, basically, I look over 3D maps um, and I correct them. Um, I'm looking for any errors or any issues. So I just search over maps. It's very cool. I am probably like most women. Um, had never thought about it, had never been uh, steered in that direction. You know, we call it occupational segregation, those roles where, you know, we, women just aren't talked about um, in, in geospatial. And so 
We are just really excited to be able to partner with organizations like Maryville University who really helped us create the curriculum so that women could get trained quickly for those new opportunities in, in, G, in the geospatial industry. We love RUNC. We love what they stand for. We love what they do and the people that they serve. Uh, it's very much needed in this city to look for women in a stable environment who are trying to improve their economic conditions. Uh, so we're very much mission aligned with RUNG. I would definitely tell somebody this is the place to come. I wouldn't have never imagined my life would be how my life is right now. And this all has happened in over 365 days. I would say give yourself the time and put in the effort, you will be rewarded. It's, you're going to have a great outcome. Your life is going to be better. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Making the best use of farmland in between growing seasons takes innovative thinking. St. Louis biotechnology startup company Covercrest says it has farmers covered with an all-new cover crop that's converted from a particular weed called field pennycress. Really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We're taking a winter annual weed and through breeding and agronomy and gene editing, we've converted it into a new rotational crop that fits in the Midwest, fits between a corn crop and a soybean crop, grows over the winter, so it's giving a farmer a third crop over two seasons, so a new opportunity for revenue on the same acre, plus all the added ecosystem benefits of a cover crop. They call the crop Covercress, which is the name of the company. Progress is made on field research plots. The company is showcasing the success of its climate smart seed technology on a nearby farm in Illinois. Our ultimate product is, is renewable biodiesel and with a low carbon footprint. Which means when cover crest grain is crushed, the oil produced is a lower carbon intensity feedstock for multiple uses, such as renewable diesel fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, and high protein animal feed. And it's good for the soil. We can actually look the farmer in the eye and tell the farmer, look, we have a place for this stuff to go. You will be paid for it. And, and we've got a great crop for you to try to grow uh, that's both gonna benefit your soil and benefit the environment. The company is demonstrating its potential to industry experts and possible customers, including neighboring farmers. For David Wessel, having a cover crop is nothing new. I've been utilizing cover crops for several years and, and it just would fit into my rotation, at least on my farm, I think, as uh, some way I can get a little extra cash or a little revenue off that cover crop that I'm putting out there. The cover crust crop is new to Wessel and gives him much more to consider. We had this opportunity to come out today to the field day to see firsthand, I guess, what they are actually doing. For years, we considered pennycrest as a weed that you would try to terminate, and they're taking it to the next extreme where they can get the oil from it. And also a feed source that I learned today that I didn't know um, is going directly into poultry feed. It all started in the lab. The research is ongoing, and at Covercrest, improvements are made through the gene editing process. These are primers. They're just a tool that we use to identify the knockouts that we're trying to achieve. The plasmids contain inserts that we put into our penny crest, and the plant will express that insert, which just goes around and cutting different genes that we're interested in. Plasmid was inserted into the plant, and it's the expression that CRISPR is present. Uh, it's the tissue expressing that glowing component because it's attached to the CRISPR, so it's just a visual representation that there has been a transformation made. The crop has gone from the bench to the field, and from here, the goal is getting it to market. The customers and the folks that we talked to today obviously have a lot of interest. We had a couple of customers in the field that we just uh, that I just heard wanted to double their order after coming to the field today, so that's always a good thing. As the pod matures, those grains will be threshed out. For more information, go to our website, hecmedia.org. HEC Media, recognized, celebrated, honored time and again for excellence in the industry. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence. 
Find all of the award-winning content at hecmedia.org. At the age of 15, endurance swimmer Lynn Cox swam the English Channel. And then a man from Springfield, Mass, Davis Hart, broke my time. So I went back and broke his time. Then she swam across the Bering Strait and changed the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. By her courage, she showed how close to each other our two peoples live. If you believe in something and you really want to do it, you keep trying because that's what life is about. Lynn dove into another adventure one day when she saw a video of a dog leaping out of a helicopter into a lake in northern Italy whose purpose was to rescue a person in the water. The dog was from the Italian School of Water Rescue Dogs, canines that work as lifeguards and patrol 30 of Italy's busiest beaches. They go along the coast of Italy, but also on the patrol boats with the Italian Coast Guard. The book, Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog, the Making of a Super Athlete, was born after she made a visit to the school in Italy. It tells the inspiring story of an enthusiastic Newfoundland puppy named Al, who along with several other candidates, is hoping to become one of these fearless lifesavers. I saw these dogs leaping out of helicopters into the lake in northern Italy on a video. And I just thought, this is incredible. How do they train to do this? This is so much more than teaching a dog to sit or come or stay. So I wound up going to Italy and being invited to watch the group in Italy train the dogs, which was fantastic because they were training like we did on the swim team. They had the beginning swimmers learning to swim in one lane, then the intermediate, then the advanced and the elite. As you visited with them, you witnessed them learning to communicate and trust each other. Tell us more about this relationship and the importance of trust. Well, one of the things that I saw them doing was teaching the puppies to swim. And that was so much fun because you could see that they were just starting to coordinate their paws. And they, they would support the puppies and keep their heads high above the water so they never felt in any kind of fear or danger. And then as the puppy started coordinating the paws over the course of a few days, then they would give them a little less support. And I just kept thinking, this is exactly the way my parents taught my brother and sisters and me to swim. We meet a lot of dogs in the book, including uh, several dogs that are experienced water rescue animals. But the heart of the book is Al, obviously, a dog that really struggles with learning the skills and the discipline needed. What about Al really captured your heart? Well, I think it was because she was so rambunctious and she had so much energy and you could tell that she was just such a bright dog. And the thing about her was that she was owned by Donatella Pasquale, who was vice president of the school. And she had trained so many dogs and so many people and saw their potential. But she wasn't able, it seemed, to get through to Al. So it was really difficult because here I am visiting Italy to watch the dogs perform and her dog doesn't seem to be getting it. But there's a point where she's working through this level of, of training where she's gonna take Al to go out and be on one of the Italian lifeguard boats. And if she can pass this test, then she becomes one of the elite water rescue dogs and is able to patrol the shores along with the Italian Coast Guard. So it's a very critical time that I arrive there and it's very tense and I'm wondering what's gonna happen. And we're not gonna tell you what happens. You have to read the book. <laughs> to find out why her book about dogs in Italy has a St. Louis connection, watch her full interview at hecmedia.org. Inside St. Louis's largest showboat, later on Spotlight. This new exhibition at the St. Louis Science Center is Hockey Faster Than Ever, and it's going to dive into the science and engineering that goes into this very popular sport. I think it's going to be great for everyone, whether or not you're a hockey super fan or you're just coming at it from the science perspective, there's something here for everybody. 
So this is a traveling exhibition. Uh, we're actually the second North American city to be able to host this exhibition. And uh, every host city is going to get to add their own local flavor to the exhibition. And of course here with the St. Louis Blues, we have a lot that we can focus on. So when you come here, you're not going to just see the same exhibition that every other state is going to have. You're also going to see some artifacts from the history of the Blues that are important to us here in the community. You're going to see some incredible objects from the Plager family. And of course, Bob, Barkley, and Bill were huge in the early days of the St. Louis Blues. And I think it'll be a fun way to see a little bit of their personal lives. And I think by the time that you'll leave, you'll see that the NHL and uh, the St. Louis Blues, our community, are all intertwined in a way that is really rich and interesting, and it just adds to the story of St. Louis. Those of you who are longtime fans may recognize as you enter the exhibition, we've recreated parts of the old arena where the Blues used to play up until 1994. That's an important story to St. Louis, where it came from, why the arena was originally built, because it wasn't originally for hockey, and then how important it was once the Blues took home here. So I think it'll be fun, a little bit of a nostalgic trip, and a way that our longtime fans and those who are brand new can have a conversation about some cool old stories. But then as you get into the exhibition, we're going to start you out with the history of hockey because it's actually an interesting story that combines some native influences here in North America and some European games coming together at exactly the right time. You're going to learn a little bit about the uh, history of hockey, including some fun facts like there were a lot of early all-women's leagues. It wasn't considered something unusual. You're also going to find out that the first indoor hockey game happened in 1875 up in Canada. But I think even more fun is that the first electrified building in Canada was supposedly a hockey rink, which I think says a lot about how popular the sport is up there. While a lot of super fans may know a little bit about the history of hockey, some of our guests are going to come from it from a science perspective, so they're not going to have that knowledge. But I think even the biggest hockey fan is going to find something in the exhibition that they didn't know about the origins. And then as we move through, we're going to see how that history led to the developments of the game, whether it be the rules in the rink or whether it be the gear that the player is using and wearing how much engineering and design it takes to make those things function the way they do today. And I think it's important to see that science happens all around us, even during our favorite sport, and that gives it a way of connecting with all of us. We may not all be the best athletes, but maybe we'll design the next stick or the next piece of safety gear that is worn on the ice. And I think that that's an important lesson to learn. There's a lot of interactive opportunities here at this exhibition. We know that a lot of people learn through doing, and we're gonna give you that opportunity here at Hockey Faster Than Ever. There's touchscreen interactives, which are of course all the rage right now, but we also know that some people wanna be able to hold a stick and see how they can do inside of a real a hockey situation. So we're gonna let you fire some pucks down at a net, see how fast you can hit it or how many targets you can hit. It's gonna be fun for everyone, whether you're a seasoned pro or it's your first time holding a stick. I'm really hoping everybody will have the chance to come out and see hockey faster than ever here at the St. Louis Science Center. It's going to be on display up until Labor Day. If you're interested in tickets, either call our reservationists or go to slsc.org. For original programming and award-winning content, explore hecmedia.org. Find all of your favorite genres, including the arts and sciences. Go in-depth with the latest research. Get insight into new technologies. Learn about breakthrough discoveries. Find it all in one place. Explore HECmedia.org. This story is brought to you in partnership with STL Made. One out of every three bites of food you take is, is bee pollinated. You can eat a lot of calories in the forms of pasta and rice and bread, but that provides very little nutrition. You know, you need your fruits and your veggies and, and you need, you know, you need salsa. Being able to grow your own food is such a, it's a thing that for a lot of people can be really empowering. Like you're not gonna produce every calorie that you need to eat, but just the idea that you can grow your own food for a lot of people is really, is really powerful. And for some people it's, it's really important. Community gardens and orchards are, I think, pretty important in fulfilling some of our food desert needs in St. Louis. So my community garden, for instance, runs a produce stand in the summer and takes EBT and sells all of our produce. 
this kind of project where we're really collaborating with people who are making decisions in yards every day, right? Or in gardens every day, making those decisions and really trying to process what is the best way to do all of the things that we need this land to do, which is to, to provide food, to provide green spaces for human health, but then also supporting biodiversity. We can also address very specific, you know, immediate questions to these communities, which is, you know, how can I enhance fruit yield in my little garden? So we have found that part of the reason why that yield is going up and down is because the pollinators are not consistent. So you have to then manage your little environment, your little habitat that is your community garden in a way that you attract the bees, the bees reproduce, and then next year you come back with bigger and better bees, year after year after year. Most bees, 70% roughly, nest in the ground. And a lot of the way that we treat the ground is, is we walk on it, we, we make it compact, we put lawn down, which covers it up. The largest agricultural product in the United States is the American lawn. In terms of acreage, in terms of consumption of energy, in terms of consumption of water, we're spending all this time and effort and energy and chemicals into maintaining one species at a very specific height. It gives us this sense of order, this aesthetic that is very ingrained into our sensibilities. And we codified that into homeowners association, into uh, municipal policies, and into home value. And so, and, and that's, that's a very artificial cultural construct. So one of the things that is the best for bees is lazy gardening. And I don't mean to say like, wild and unkept. When you cut back your stems, don't cut them all the way down to the ground. Cut them a little bit and leave just a little bit so that they can nest there. Essentially, if there's something you want to do is don't do it. Don't put mulch, don't mow, don't fertilize, and don't use pesticides. Oh, all of a sudden, guess what? Bees are start colonizing your yard. Visit thestl.com for more stories like this one. You just never know where that spark is going to come from. You're putting a human touch to everything through the vehicle of art. We give them the ability to hope. Goldenrod Showboat was a fixture on the St. Louis Riverfront for decades. But today, all that remains of the largest showboat ever to travel the Mississippi River is jammed into a couple of storage lockers in Jerseyville, Illinois. Got a sample here of some of the old wallpaper from the showboat. They've got sheet music in here. The big chandelier from the theater is right here. You know, telling the story about it, you know, it, it makes me light up because it's Americana. It's history that you cannot replicate anywhere else. We have all the uh, stage lights from the showboat. Jake Medford was never on the showboat in its heyday. He's only 27 years old. But much of his youth has been spent getting to know the goldenrod in her dotage. When I got involved and started getting on board more and more, that's when you really fall in love with the place, and it was just amazing. By day, Jake runs his family's gas stations and serves as the minister at Jerseyville's Church of Christ. But much of his free time is spent saving the goldenrod soul. It had a rough life going throughout history, but the amazing thing is, is these showboats were built to last 
roughly 10 to 15 years. That's all they would last. But this one lasted, you know, much, much longer. She endured crashes, fire, and foreclosure. And yet the Goldenrod continued cruising through 15 states from 1909 until 1937, when she docked in St. Louis for repairs and ended up staying for more than 50 years. Then, in 1989, the city of St. Charles bought the Goldenrod and moved the showboat to their riverfront. But within a few years, the need for expensive repairs brought down the curtain. In 2008, the Goldenrod was donated to the St. Louis-based Historic Riverboat Preservation Association, and they moved it to a private mooring in Campsville, Illinois hoping to raise enough money to bring the goldenrod back to life. And Campsville is where Jake Medford, who was 19 at the time, first discovered the goldenrod when he and a friend thought it would be fun to climb aboard and take pictures. Once we took the photos, that's when we started taking time to look up the history. And the more that him and I did research on it, we were attracted to it more and more. Jake got in touch with the preservation group to see if they wanted any of his pictures. Turned out what they needed was someone who lived near the boat to be its caretaker. Jake got the job. We kept a sample of each glass that was on the show boat. The idea was to try to keep the boat intact while raising money to restore it. But in 2014, while trying to reposition the boat at the mooring site, the hull was damaged beyond repair. And that's when the decision was made to start removing all the artifacts. We have some of the costumes still. A lot of people will recognize some of this from the ceilings. Apparently another prop, you know. Once all the artifacts had been removed, the plan was to dismantle the rest of the boat, store the lumber, and someday rebuild it. But on October 26, 2017, that plan was dashed when the goldenrod mysteriously caught fire. I was lost. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. I know things don't go out with dignity, but that was just horrible. A few spent fireworks were found around the boat, but no one has ever really figured out what caused it to burn. We kept everything we could. This is an old menu. Now the plan is to find a museum interested in exhibiting what remains of the grandest showboat ever to travel the rivers of America. Keeping its story alive, that's important, because otherwise it's going to be lost forever. I never gave up on it, no. And that's why I'm still here. Next week, a local study about the accuracy of at-home COVID tests which ones work the best? Plus, a view into an underwater world that most people will never experience. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.